Okay. Uh, I hope I'm I'm audible. Okay. Yes. Hey, hi guys. Welcome to the Dev Day. Uh, those who are joining for the first time, uh, I'll just quickly introduce what is Dev Day is. So Dev Day is a monthly formal event for developers to share their experiences, ideas, and opinions about the technology. We organize, we as in Sahaj, organize this event monthly and quite frequently twice a month also. Uh, we regularly update our meetup links uh, on, on our meetup pages and you can subscribe to those pages and follow us to know about more technology and more about the day of day. So today we are going to talk about building a search engine for interactive search. We have Kishore Nalan, who is subject matter expert in this area. He's a co-founder of TypeSense. Is, uh, it is an open source search engine optimized for speed and developer productivity. Uh, I will hand it over to Kishore now. Uh, hey, Kishore. Hey, hi. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. So let me share my screen and then we'll get started. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm Kishore. Um, I'm co-founder of TypeSense. Um, uh, we, with the way we uh, present TypeSense is as a open source alternative um, to Algolia or an easier to use alternative to Elasticsearch. That's the way we frame it. Um, uh, I'm mostly going to talk about um, how, why we built TypeSense, uh, but from a technical angle in the sense uh, what does it take to build a search engine for interactive search? Because that's what uh, TypeSense is. Um, so I want to basically take that problem statement and kind of derive from first principles, like how we ended up with uh, the, some of the design decisions, some of the trade-offs uh, you know, with TypeSense and how, how one thing led to the other, right? So uh, very quick uh, introduction about myself. Um, um, so TypeSense has been, a, um, started off as a nights and weekends project, uh, working on it for almost seven years, uh, but uh, started doing it full-time two years back. Um, we have a, a cloud hosted offering. That's how uh, we pay our bills, uh, but it's a 100% open source uh, product, uh, not open core, fully open source. You can run it on your own infrastructure or you can use our cloud if you wish to, um, um, if you wish to just host it, not want to host it yourself. And, uh, so the problem basically began in my earlier companies, right? As with most ideas, you scratch your itch, right? So um, in my previous company, I was a SRE at Zapier. Uh, before that, I, I was an engineer at Index and ThoughtWorks. And um, and search, uh, and my co-founder, uh, Jason, he worked, uh, he, he has also worked in this uh, with different search technologies. He has been in a couple of uh, e-commerce companies. So where search is a very much of a, uh, a revenue driver, um, good search really can like push the revenue up. So we came across a lot of problems uh, with search, uh, we, which we felt like the existing solutions, uh, which is primarily Elasticsearch and Solar um, really didn't uh, really address in inadequate terms, right? Um, so what we really wanted to do was uh, democratize search in the sense uh, we wanted to make it available to teams of all sizes uh, by you know reducing the search engine learning curve and you know if you're bringing a new product to the market uh, which is uh, which which is very interactive in nature which has a huge search component uh, we just want to make it like really easy to do that uh, because we felt like um, the existing solutions were uh, quite difficult to do uh, quite quite difficult and and what we are essentially doing is we are, uh, we're taking something that Elasticsearch does uh, broadly and then unbundling it for specifically for um, interactive search and uh, uh, and, and uh, like type ahead searches, autocomplete and so on. So um, as you all know, search is everywhere, right? We, we are producing a lot of content, consuming a lot of com content and, um, and it has almost be, uh, become like a navigational element, whether you look at uh, mobile apps or e-commerce or, you know, um, SaaS apps. Uh, it is it is like a navigational component. People uh, want to like use the search bar to really like quickly cut the uh, cut the um, 
clutter and they'll go directly to what they are trying to find, right? And search is not just a search as a as like you type something and you see a bunch of results. It's a lot, always a lot, of, lot, lot of interaction um, related to that, right? So if you go to e-commerce store, you're going to have this uh, uh, categories listing. You click on it, so you're basically filtering and searching at the same time. So it's like a browsing plus interactive navigation kind of experience. So that's how that's a trend that we are seeing. That's how uh, apps are being built. And uh, building this uh, today is still very difficult, right? And I'm going to talk about what are the problems and how we are solving that with TypeSense, right? So uh, we will broadly look at two areas. One is the speed, uh, because we want to do interactive search experience. So your goal is to be um, delivering results, especially for type ahead search within maybe 50 to 100 milliseconds. Anything faster, than, anything slower than that is going to be very perceptive. Uh, it's no longer going to seem like an instant search experience for people and uh, and the user interface how do you build this whole thing like because if it's a static render it's much easier you make an api call you have a template um uh, the page refreshes and you have it but for when you're doing interactive search so many things are going to be changing on screen um and uh, how do you do that so before i i uh, so I, let me begin by first um showing a demo right of what i mean by interactive search so that uh we can you can get a picture of uh, like what I'm going to talk about, right? So here is a simple e-commerce store and it's powered by TypeSense. Uh, so when I mean by interactive search, I mean this, right? So when I'm typing Samsung, the page, uh, I don't know how uh, uh, interactive it looks on this uh, on the on the video uh, share, but it pretty much uh, just uh, uh, works. And you you can see like as I type when when I delete some of the words, you can see the highlights here changing. It's only highlighting what you're typing. And then you can like, you know, quickly drill down, remove this, and you want to search within a brand, like something like this, you can search that. And that also gets highlighted, um, filtering by pricing and so on. So this is what I made my uh, single page interactive search. Um, something similar will be like a recipe search is another demo. So uh, searching for pineapple uh, with sugar, pineapple and things like that. And you can see like the, it is taking like 50 to 64 milliseconds on like a 2.2 million data set, right? So this is what I mean by interactive uh, search. Uh, so coming back to our presentation. So uh, the speed is one huge uh, challenge. And the second one is in user interface because so many things are getting updated at the same time. So uh, like really writing uh, all of those interactions uh, are going to be difficult unless we have some form of framework to do that. Okay, so and as far as the speed is concerned, you you have to deal with network latency, which is the round trip time from the time that you press your first keystroke and you get the results on your computer, right? Um, and the query latency is what actually happens on the server, uh, how the results are fetched, how they are ranked, and uh, how they are sorted and given back uh, given back. So that time uh, that is mostly an algorithmic. Uh, component there, which is the query latency. I also I'll talk about, I'll begin with network latency, what are the challenges, and then I'll move on to the query latency. And then uh, we will, in the end, we will look at the user interface uh, challenges at the last. So uh, we, let's begin with a typical search infrastructure. So you have a user uh, typing the query running shoes, um, and uh, that is exposed to a, like that hits an app server, it could be Django or Rails. Um, and then uh, it goes to an aggregation server, uh, which is basically a search cluster. Let's say it's Elasticsearch, which you, you will typically have like an aggregation uh, nodes, and then you're going to have the data nodes, right? Where the actual search in indices are kept. So your query goes from the app server, the app server makes a call to your uh, Elasticsearch API, which is hitting the proxy or the aggregation server. Then it is going to talk to one or more uh, search, node, uh, search nodes, get the data back, re-rank them, and then send it back to the user. Okay, this is how a typical search infrastructure looks like. So now look at let's let's say that you know the user is in London and and your server is in Oregon, right? And um, and for most uh, people, um, data stores are typically kept in a single data center. Even though we have edge now, and that's mostly for CDNs, uh, for serving static assets, um, or like you know serverless is also again like services. Uh, but the raw data, whether it's your database or your search. Uh, it is still a difficult problem where it is usually confined to a single data center. So let's assume that's in Oregon, or if you're on AWS, Virginia, or one of the AWS zones. And uh, and for most web applications, the users are going to be global. Even if 
not 100% of your users are very widely spread out. Even if you're primarily US focused, 20 to 30% could easily come from Europe, right? So you have someone from London uh, typing running shoes. Uh, that is going to be a 100 millisecond round trip just on the network latency to our, our data center in Oregon. Uh, and then even within your data center, uh, if you're from, from your app server, you're going to hit the uh, Elasticsearch uh, proxy node, and then that talks with its data shards, uh, shard, data nodes, and that is going to be 10 to 15 minutes. And so you can see all these network hops, right? They are adding up very quickly. If a goal is to serve uh, instant search in 50 to 100 milliseconds, and that network times, uh, the network hops themselves kind of eat up your entire budget, right? And we are not even, I haven't even mentioned Nginx. Usually you're going to have an Nginx in front of your app server, even though it might be inter-process, uh, but it's still, it's a, it's a, it's an additional uh, overhead. And then you're going to have a load balancer because you're not going to have a single app server. So you're going to have a bunch of form of app servers. So the user is actually talking to a load balancer, which again proxies it and so on. So as you can see, it's a lot of network hops. So what can we do like uh, to reduce this and you know to like kind of uh, take a handle on the network latency part? So the simplest thing is like, you know, I don't want to talk to an app server. Let me talk to the Elasticsearch or the search uh, cluster directly, right? So I bypass the app server. So I will bypass the load balancer. But, but immediately you are faced with this problem of in a multi-tenanted environment, how do you handle ACL? How do you handle authentication? So let's say you have um, uh, search records from uh, multiple uh, customers, multiple um, uh, organizations. Let's say you belong to an organization and all, all of the data is stored on a single uh, search cluster. So when you search for something, you want the search to be scoped to only your data, only your organization, only your records. So um, Elasticsearch or Solar don't have anything out of the box for to solve that because you have to solve the authentication. And much more importantly, when you're exposing uh, your search cluster to the internet directly for, for, for you to talk from your web browser or your the client, uh, you need a production grade HTTP server or some form of production grade TCP server there, right? Uh, it, because you do all your data is going to be there, it needs to be patched up, it needs, it needs, it needs, to, be, um, it needs to be secure. Um, so you run into that problem. So let's say that, you know, um, let's say we solve some of those issues uh, somehow. And uh, uh, yeah. Shall I ask a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So in this case also, like the, the person who is running queue is equal to running shoes has to mm -hmm. go to the network to, to identify the HTTP server, right? Uh, so you will have a DNS. Uh, it will be HTTP server. Yes. Um, so I so I, I didn't get your question, but yeah, you're right. You have to go through the HTTP server. But what here? What I'm saying is, you can skip the you can skip the app server if you if you're able to talk to your search server directly. Yeah, if my, my question the search was, server itself had a, a API. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. My question was, uh, as I as a user, I, let's say I'm searching from my system. Uh, to talk to that, uh, let's say a server, any server, let's say HTTP server or something, then ne the network hop, mm -hmm. hop has to happen, right? Yes, the network hop has to happen, yes. But that means that 100 millisecond latency is still there. Right, right, I'm, I'm not done yet. I'm, I'm going to derive, okay. uh, I, I, let, let me finish this, uh, let, let me finish okay. through this. I'm going to derive it. So, uh, so what, what we're trying to do is it's an exercise in seeing how many of these middlemen we can, right? That's going to be what we're trying to do. So let, 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 I'll show you. So let, let's say that um, you, you don't want to talk to the aggregation server also, because that's, as you said, there's an additional network hop there, right? You, which, which has the, uh, the search index that you, that you have there you want but that means that you're not going to have uh, uh, you can't have sharding right uh, and uh, that um uh, shards and you know fetch the data for you but you do reduce the hop by not uh, going to the aggregation server and going to the data sh uh, uh, sh shard so let's assume that is fine let's say you have a very small uh, let's say you don't want to shard uh, and you want to talk to the uh, data node directly right uh, but still as you said there is still that hop there is going to be uh, that whatever that data index, wherever it is, as long as it is in Oregon, you are going to have a, a network latency from London going, uh, making a call into Oregon, right? So, what if we, what if we have like a geographically distributed uh, thing? Because because it's hard physics. You if if you want, if you want to cut down on the network latency, you have to move 
the data close to the user, as simple as that. And that's how CDNs work, uh, edge networks work. Uh, but let's assume it's not a true edge network. You're just distributing data to, let's say, four or five uh, major uh, continents. And so that uh, you, know, you are putting it close to the user. Um, and uh, like, for example, let's say there is a, there is a data center, there's a, there's a node in Europe, right? And, uh, and it, so, that were, so the customer from London will be sent into Europe. So that will reduce the search latency to maybe 20, 30 milliseconds, depending on where exactly it's there in Europe. And, um, but we do have, need to have a fallback because if that, that node goes down, you need to be able to hit one of the other nodes. It will be slower. Maybe we will hit the node in Asia. Uh, it will be a bit more slower, but it's okay because that is going to be a temporary mitigation. As the uh, the main node comes back, the European node comes back up. You're you're going to go. You're going to look at the some other node, right? So, so so unless you move the data close to the user, you cannot really solve the network latency issue. Um, even if you solve the other issues that I, that I mentioned um, about like authentication, production grade HTTP server sharding, and so on. So. So if you look at the search server requirements, right? If you want to really do a search uh, without having all this middleman, so you can get the end-to-end -end search within 50 to 75 milliseconds, then you need to have a production grade HTTP server for your clients to talk to directly. You need fine grained ACLs for client authorization. I should be able to generate an API key that says that, hey, I can use, there must be a filter embedded into it, like for that organization ID equal to X, right? And the API key itself must uh, bind to that. They should not, I shouldn't be able to tamper it since I'm making calls from the client side. Uh, and it should be able to be fast even without sharding, right? Um, and uh, it should be geographically distributed because uh, you have to move that data close to the user. That's the only way to uh, like reduce network hops. And uh, lastly, um, since you do not have any load balance of uh, load balancer or any aggregating servers, you have to do client side routing and client side failover. So, uh, in that previous example that I showed, if the Europe node goes down, the client should be able to fall back, right? So you become client heavy because you're cutting down the role that the traditional load balancer will usually play uh, in like removing bad nodes or no, uh, rotating out bad nodes and putting back the good ones. Cool. So, uh, so TypeSense implements all of of this um so uh we we worked backwards and we felt like you know if this is what we need to do then uh we we need to have a production grade HTTP servers we need to give great acs and we should be able to design the server uh, uh without being without us needing to shard it so we will just duplicate the data so the same data x is going to be here in all the regions there is no sharding the data is not going to be split across machines it will be a mirror replica of the data across the nodes and um, and uh, and since you do not have the benefit of um, horizontal sharding, you have to shard vertically, right? And uh, and uh, and you need to be able to do like a geographical distribution. So uh, this is this is a set of requirements we kind of arrive at, and uh, with TypeSense we 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 implement all of that. So let me talk about um, some of this and uh, and how we how we implement uh, make, make some of these things, right? So uh, we use Raft uh, for clustering. Um, and uh, if uh, if you're not familiar with Raft, it's a way for you to uh, ensure that a bunch of nodes are in sync. Um, and um, let's say you're storing data, and uh, and you have like three or five nodes. Uh, you you write data to one node. You want all the other nodes to like pick that up. If any node dies in between, they should be able to come back uh, and be in sync, right? And uh, Raft is a protocol that helps you achieve this consensus. And uh, the way Raft works is they uh, every cluster has a leader that is elected. So let's say you have three nodes, the nodes will elect a leader and, uh, and all rights will go through a leader. So you, your rights are serialized. You cannot have this split, uh, a, a scenario where uh, two nodes accept a right and one node goes down and you do not know which right should come first, right? It's a very strongly consistent, uh, it's a protocol that ensures strong consistency. Um, so rights go through a leader and then you have odd number of nodes so you can do a quorum. So uh, any anytime a right comes, uh, you need a quorum, which is the majority of nodes to acknowledge it so that uh, uh, you, you, you can persist the right. So technically you can run like even a seven node or a nine node or 11 node cluster, but because you have this requirement that a majority of the nodes need to take part in a right acknowledgement, uh, it is going to slow down your rights. So uh, typically three to five nodes is what you will run. Uh, you will want to run more than that. 
Um, and also Raft will, uh, a good Raft library, I'll talk about this in the next slide, will, allow, uh, will support like fault tolerance and automatic recovery and so on. Um, so, so what TypeSense uh, uses is a library called Raft by Baidu. Uh, because TypeSense is written in C++, uh, and uh, so we use Graph, which is a C++ library. There are other libraries uh, in other, uh, there, is, uh, there is one in uh, Go by HashiCorp, Raft. Um, so th the way it works is you have this, it's a state machine. Basically, the whole library is like a state machine. You have these different statuses like follower, candidate, and leader. And then you have these uh, interfaces, uh, functions that you need to write. Um, and uh, once you write it, uh, it will, um, it will, it will, you just have to implement the, uh, those functions and uh, it will, you, you will be able to um, uh, implement the entire clustering. So if I have to show quickly TypeSense code, um, so you, you just, uh, this is Braft, um, which is the library you're using, you just extend uh, your state from a state machine. And then you just have to implement a bunch of uh, functions like, you know, uh, what happens when a when when a when a uh, snapshot is called? Uh, so how do you snapshot your state? Whether you want to store it to another directory on your disk, I mean another disk on your machine, or you want to store it into S3? I will just implement do snapshot. Uh, so the the library will call that when it does the periodic snapshotting. Um, then uh, if you want to do like you know what do you do when you want to load the snapshot, or what do you want to do when the leader starts? What do you want to do on shutdown? Um, and so on and so forth. So you just have all these hooks. Uh, you implement all of this. The the big the uh, most important one here is the apply. So which is the actual write. So basically, you get an iterator of uh, uh, data that is written uh, to the cluster. So how do I persist it? I could write. So I just need to write this, implement this particular function, and uh, and raft the and the underlying raft library will take care of um, uh, see. Do calling the orchestration and doing the synchronization and so on, right? So if you are, um, so if you want to build something like this, uh, like a clustering solution, um, uh, uh, Raft is a good choice, and uh, there are like uh, mature libraries out there that allows you to, um, like, just write a few implementation uh, functions, and uh, you get you get the uh, you get the entire clustering working. Um, so the the so what is what is the price that we pay for the low network latency? Because uh, nothing comes with nothing comes uh, without trade offs, right? So we have chosen so since our goal as a, a search for TypeSense, we have chosen specifically to solve for interactive search experiences, which is like a uh, which is like a, 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 a fraction of the all kinds of search uh, uh, search use cases that you have your log search, which is which you do not need it to be interactive. There are like uh, like the searches on like journals and so on, which you don't have to be interactive. But we have chosen to solve a specific problem that Elasticsearch and the existing search solutions are not great at. So we are so what we like to call is we are unbundling Elasticsearch, right? So we are solving a specific set of uh, 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 problems that it's not great at uh, out of the box. So so that so we have to make some trade off. So, so then the trade off that we make for this is that uh, we cannot short data across the nodes because the minute you have like two nodes that you have to query, the slowest of the two nodes is going to uh, it is going to be the binding factor for the total response time. If one of the nodes is slow uh, and networks tend to be a lot flakier than disks, so you are going to be stuck on that. So uh, and there's going to be high vari variance in the uh, response time. So we will only have one data. We're not sharding it. So the minute you say that you're not going to shard your data across nodes, that means you have to be doing vertical scaling. Um, and uh, you have to do in-memory indices uh, because uh, you, you have to be as fast as possible. Um, and uh, and, and, and all, both of these things naturally mean that you're actually focused on uh, solving for like searching about 100 million records. Because um, let's, it's, today you can rent a, a cloud uh, instance on AWS or um, Google Cloud like that has like a 500 GB RAM or one terabyte RAM that's uh, pretty um, easy to do. And that usually we had customers index 150, 160, even 200 million records, depending on how large your records are um, uh, into TypeSense. But this is the scale that we want to tackle 100 million records. And, and when people tell us like what happens when I have a 10, 10 terabyte data set that uh, I need to index, then uh, the, what I what I usually tell them is uh, it's like the axe versus knife as the analogy I give them. Uh, just because both your axe and knife are sharp, 
uh, you wouldn't, you don't want to use an axe to chop your bread, right? You don't want to, you don't want your axe to slice your bread. You want to use a knife for that. So, uh, so we choose our battles. Uh, we are focusing on up to hundred million records, uh, which is like vast majority of the use cases. If you really need uh, something more than that, uh, uh, um, that is probably not the best fit for TypeSense, and that is okay. You don't, not every software needs to work for like zero to like uh bazillion records right so it is okay we choose our battle uh, so we spoke about uh network late uh, like tackling network latency and what it what are what are the implications of uh, that means right in terms of the design decisions and so on uh let's now look at uh query latency right um so at the heart of every search engine, uh, regardless of uh, uh, even if you take TypeSense or even Google, uh, the, the way search engines are implemented is through an uh, inverted index, right? So let's say that um, an inverted index is basically a mapping between, you can look, up, you can look at it as a giant hash map. Uh, the hash map is uh, between the words that are in your uh, corpus and the documents that they occur in. And uh, additionally, you will also want to store the positions that they occurred in the document. Like for example, uh, the word Apple appeared in the uh, 15th, uh, as appeared as the 15th word in the document and so on. But I have uh, omitted that for simplicity, let's just take that you have a word to document ID listing mapping, right? Um, and when a query like Washington Apple comes, uh, what, you will, what the search engine will do is it will go look up Apple, look up at the list of IDs that uh, it occurs in, and then it looks go go looks up Washington looks set, looks up the list of IDs that that up, appears in and then you do an intersection you do an and uh, and when you do an and you get the resulting documents that contain both the words so you know I've simplified a lot of things here uh, but on the very high level this is how our inverted index works um, uh, broadly right um, but for for I have a question if you don't mind yeah sure. So you were talking about you support up to 100 million records, uh, and then I assume it's, it's scaling vertically and all. How how much memory does that typically take? In in uh, yeah yeah. So so in memory, so it's a uh, so from what we have seen from from our customers, uh, you could say that it takes about two to two and a half times your disk storage, but that's a very rough. Uh, yardstick because some data sets it really depends on the shape of your data because some data sets compress very well for example let's say i had a million documents and uh, i had only four unique words in the entire million document set let's say most of these are identifiers and they like for example gender uh, things a company and they low cardinality low cardinality cardinality fields that appear a lot a lot of times right then it's going to compress very well because um uh, you're going to have like uh, a word and like list of IDs that they appear in. So the total data is going to be determined. The total memory usage is dependent on the IDs, right? Uh, and they compress very well. Our numbers compress really well, we compress them. So that is, uh, that's how it works. But if you're, if you're talking about like indexing giant text, large text, um, then two to three times uh, on disk storage is what we have noticed. And again, if your data has a lot of numerical fields, uh, again, it will be much smaller than text fields, and um, and um, and a lot of times people have a lot of numerical fields, numerical filters to that like, goes along with their text. So it's all, a lot of times you'll have a single text field and then bunch of five six filters and uh, sorting fields that you want to apply on on top of it to slice and dice the search. So in those cases, it is not so bad. Yep, thanks. So, um, so yeah, so this, uh, so you, so you, you look, you look up the words and you intersect it, right? So this is how a, a, like a really simple search engine work, but that's not enough for uh, interactive search, right? Because uh, you want to do prefix searching and you want to do typo correction uh, because uh, when people will make mistakes uh, as they type, um, if, if you have to tell them like Google, hey, did you mean X? And for them to click on it and correct it again, that will not be truly interactive. So you want to be able to correct the typos uh, as you as people type I know as well as be able to guess what they are typing so you could you, you might even have to do a, a a typo correction on a prefix so let's say samsung and i'm typing s u m s u it's obviously not samsung's uh, first four letters uh, but you want to be able to do a prefix correct uh, typo corrected prefix search right um and and um and both of these kind of contribute to relevancy, uh, which is basically what you want. You want people to find what they are looking for fast. 
So, but how do you do this, right? How do you, uh, I'm typing A, P, P, and uh, you want to guess uh, that it must resolve to Apple. And when I am typing uh, Washington with the extra H there, uh, uh, it must resolve to Washington, right? At least with typo correction, you can kind of brute force it. Uh, there's a very uh, a popular post uh, like that comes off on Hacker News often by Peter Norwick. Uh, it is called Peter Norwick Spell Checker. Um, Peter Novick boarded a plane and he was bored and uh, he wrote a spell checker um, uh, in Python, which is basically a brute force uh, spell checker where you have, where you just index all the uh, words uh, in your dictionary and then if someone types a word with a misspelling, what, what he tries to do is just uh, tries removing a random letter, replacing it, swapping it, and then try to find, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the typo, the word with the corrected typo in the dictionary. So. That's that's one way to do it, but it's pretty expensive and it's not going to scale. Uh, the other way to uh, so, but for prefix search, you really there's nothing much you can do there. You can't even do there is nothing to like you know you can't jumble up the order of letters to actually get anything there. So um, so so yeah, hash map. I said you like you can treat this whole thing like a hash map, a giant hash map. That's not going to work, right? So what you really are looking for is tries. Uh, tries will help us solve both the issues. It will help us do typo correction and it will help up, help us do prefix uh, lookup. So let's begin with prefix lookups because that's the easiest. So let's say my, I'm trying to, uh, my, I'm trying to type do, right? So you will, you will have this giant uh, try where all you, all the words that are there in your corporate corpus are indexed and uh, at the leaf, you, you will have the actual word and then you will have the document ID listings that I uh, that I uh, that I mentioned here, right? This document ID listings will be at the leaf here. So uh, so somebody types D O for let's say a prefix completion for D O. So you go to D then O, then you will you will be able to do a depth a, a breadth first or depth first traversal here, and then identify dog and dot as your uh, two um, words that you want. And then you can pick the documents from the that are that contain dog and documents that contain dot, and then you then you rank them or filter them, apply those or whatever filtering or sorting conditions that the query has, and then return the results. And uh, uh, but what what if the word has a typo? Let's say I'm trying to find the I'm trying to query for fire f i r e, uh, but I end up typing it f typing it as f a i r e. So um, what you can do is you can implement a Levenstein uh, distance uh, search on try uh, pretty efficiently. Uh, so you, you will come to F and then uh, you, you will try to go to A and then you try to go to I and then you find out that there's no I. So you will backtrack and then you will try and find that, oh, there is no, uh, you, I, 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 there's no siblings to A, then I go back to F. And then um, again, I come back to I, and then I correct myself to find fire, which is within one typo away from the word F-A-I-R-E. So it turns out that um, if all you're looking for is one to two typos uh, errors, then uh, doing this on a try is pretty fast. Um, you can, you can because you're, you're just, especially if the typo is not on the first few letters, because your try will start off as very fat and they become very thin pretty fast. Um, so, uh, and generally people do not make uh, mistakes uh, on the first couple of characters, although I have done that here, uh, but um, in general, the performance is not too bad. You can, you can traverse uh, very quickly and you can backtrack and you can do a Levenstein distance uh, uh, searching on the try, which is what type, type sense implements. We support um, deletion, uh, addition of a, word, a letter, substitu substitution. So for instead of F-I-R-E, if, if you type F-R-I, E, we'll be able to find that. Um, we'll be, we, we are able to find that very quickly on the try and identify the candidate words and then get those documents and uh, rank and filter them. Sure, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so basically what you're saying is for all kinds of mistakes or the spell, uh, spelling mistakes, the, there is an extra note that is getting added in the try, is it? No, no, no. Uh, this is this try is not going to be any mistakes. It's it is it is going to have your actual words. So, in for example, let's say uh, your corpus had only these one, two, three, four, five words, right? Dog, dot, pump, fat, and fire. You are going to build a try out of it. Correct. And when you type the query, right? Fire. Let's say the query is F I R E. Fine. Then all you're doing to do is go to the root, go to F, go to I, go to R, go to E. You're done, right? But yeah. What happens is the, the if there is a mistake, like there's a F A I R E. So you go to F, 
and then you go to A, and then you realize there is no I, there's no I, there's only T, right? Yeah. So what you do is you will backtrack. Uh, you you will backtrack. You go up, and then you try to find another path. Where so what you will do is you will go back to F. And then you pick I, right? And you will have a counter that will, I'm very simplistically saying this, it's a pretty yeah. involved algorithm, but you will have a counter that you will maintain on the, on your stack that says that, hey, I'm at I, uh, but I have actually skipped A. So that is like one typo uh, error, right? Mm -hmm. Then I can go R, E, and I find out that, hey, I'm able to get to fire with just one typo error. But let's say there is something else, like let's say there's instead of R, there is a X here, F, I, X. And yeah. then I will do one more counter. I will say that, hey, I have now done two typos. If I and then if I find E, well, good. I have done one or two typos. I can still find uh, the word. I can get out. But let's say there is one more F I X W or something like that. The minute I find the third typo, I realize, hey, I cannot. Uh, this is not working out. I will. I don't have to go through that uh, path of the tree anymore. I can go back and uh, quit. So. Uh, if you do more than two typos, it becomes uh, really uh, expensive. But one to ty two typos, uh, you kind of uh, it is pretty fast. Uh, we can you will hardly you you can I have done like on millions of words. I you get like two to three milliseconds for to do single or double typos. It's pretty fast. And this dictionary uh, or, or the tri tree is created based on the all the information. Words. All yeah words. all the words all the words in the uh, words in your uh, corpus let's say uh, let's say the only word in the corpus is uh, kishore and then that will be the only word in the tribe but if there are like 10 titles uh, you will pick all the titles all the unique words will go into the tribe okay hey hi kishore i, I have a doubt yeah, yeah. um so like, let's say like, uh, so this is for a per word, right? Let's say for, uh, let's say I'm uh, typing, uh, I want to type dog food uh, space in between. And then I mis uh, misspell dog into D-O-D and then food, right? Uh, so D-O-D can be, can either go to D-O-G or D-O-T, right? But the food, the, the next word, right? That adds the context. And then like, probably with that, you can look back and correct it right so that the contextual yeah. chair correction is it is it possible or uh... yeah so uh yeah it's a very good question uh it's a it's also a very difficult answer because contextual correction will mean uh you will immediately have to go into a if you want to do it properly it is better to do uh, frame it as a machine learning problem um right. and uh, like let's say with like transformers and uh like semantic uh, thing you should be able to get uh, you will be able, you need to have a weight of a word in context of the surrounding words so that's what you really want uh, then it, you have to frame it as a machine learning problem uh, but what we just do in type senses we do a brute forces and since everything is in memory all your data structures in memory and we implement like really performant intersection uh, routines uh, you can get away with brute force uh, search Let's say you and generally queries are especially for again our for the use cases that we are solving like e-commerce and and uh, like app searches and you know SaaS where you're looking for people's names, people's email addresses, phone numbers. They are all like typically very short queries. I am not going to go to it will not be like a, like a Google query like where can I find X right uh, like that's it's going to be very short and pointed queries. And for those cases, uh, two to three words, we just brute force it. So we'll do like, uh, we'll start with, we'll assume that there are no typos. So we'll do direct lookup of all three words. If any one word is not found, then we will, what we'll do is, okay, we'll do uh, all typo variation one of word one uh, with a zero of word two and zero of word three, then zero, one, zero, two, one, one, and so on. So it's a brute force, right? Uh, but yes. It's fine. It is uh, generally um, it it work. It has in the real world data. If you of course, if you benchmark it with artificial data, it might not come out uh, very well. But in real world data, thankfully, uh, uh, it it is it is uh, it really works. And uh, yeah yeah, and and it avoids having to build like a complicated uh, model. And uh, and the semantic world has its own set of problems. If you have out of uh, your models cannot be updated every day. If you have, so if, if there's a new record that's get added with a new unique word, you will not be able to find the context for it. So there are a different set of problems for that. Um, uh, but for, for the large guys, right, for example, Amazon, you will notice that they don't actually use instant search. That's because for them, the value that they get out of machine learning and the contextual stuff is more important than the ability to spell correct. 
right? So um, they so they they don't do any interactive search, but for like for all our of other use cases, uh, 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 that is that requires a lot of uh, bandwidth to pull off. Okay, so uh, is is this part is it like plugin? Like is there like if if I want to build on uh, to to this correct? Let's say for a, let's say I want to plug in some ML model just to you know. So uh, is that feasible in Titan as of now? Not right now, but we do have plans to in introduce a vector data type uh, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, uh, uh, all the models, all they are, do all they are doing is doing nearest neighbor search on two vectors. So you will have a query vector and you have a bunch of document vectors and you learn the similarity between them during the model phase. And then during the search phase, you are trying to find, uh, given a vector, try to find the most similar documents. That's that's the crux of how the uh, search is, at least search is implemented with uh, 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 transformers and like other uh, ML libraries, neural network libraries. So we are planning on introducing a vector data type where for every record, you will have its vector, which describes mm -hmm. the, which describes the semantic meaning of uh, the words. Uh, maybe this is another entire uh, okay. we could probably talk uh, okay. we could probably talk fill, fill an entire talk with that uh, it's a very interesting area but yeah we, we once we have that then you can mix both of them you can you have the best of both worlds so you can have like a keyword search and uh, apply a semantic layer on top for uh, ranking or uh, if uh, you could do a, a semantic search and uh, like not do keyword at all you can choose it as per your business needs okay cool Cool. Um, that uh, let's move on. So, uh, but yeah, so tries are uh, uh, look really good on paper, but they are uh, they have a lot of drawbacks. Uh, yeah, naive implementation tends to be very memory intensive, and since TypeSense is already memory uh, bound in the sense we store all our uh, inverted lists like document IDs, position listings, all of them are in memory. Uh, if your tries uh, tries will be a really the, really the, even today they are the uh, biggest or the fattest data structure uh, that we that we have in terms of memory usage. So a naive implementation, let's say you are indexing every byte in a node. Let's say every letter, every letter is a byte. Uh, two power eight is two fifty six. Uh, uh, you can have two fifty six values. Although ASCII, if you're looking at English, you don't have the entire two fifty six. But once you go into Unicode, you're indexing. Uh, Chinese, Japanese, the Unicode characters, uh, uh, they, 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 they can vary, uh, they can have a larger range. So uh, every uh, uh, naive implementation will be like ha having 256 branches for every uh, node. Uh, and then that means that, you know, you're going to uh, be very memory hungry and each node is going to be a pointer. And that means 64 bytes. So uh, a naive in implementation is very uh, slow. And it's also not very um, uh, CPU cache friendly. Uh, because let's say you're doing this try traversal, so you will be doing a lot of traverses as I, as I explained earlier, when there is a typo error and you realize that you know you don't, you're not able to find the exact sequence of characters that the query has, the words, the characters in the word uh, uh, in the query, uh, you will have to do a back traversal and come for uh, like move for forwards and backwards, right? And every time you do that, you will have to jump, you will probably jump into a different part of the gram. Uh, for example, B and P, uh, they, they are adjacent in your try, but they will be in totally different parts of your CPU RAM. So there will be no cache locality. So when I retrieve a D, I will not benefit uh, from P being close to close to it. It won't be, right? It will be in a totally different part of the RAM because you will be doing an allocation of uh, this P independently of D. So um, they will be very far apart. So we cannot, uh, so it will really slow things down, right? So thankfully uh, we can do better. There are, there is, there are like a class or family of uh, data structures that kind of improve on the Radix tree. Radix tree is a tree with like 256 leaves. That's the neighbors implementation. Um, uh, for example, you, uh, the one that TypeSense uses is called ART. Uh, this, it's called the adaptive Radix tree. Uh, this, uh, you can find the more details in that, in the paper uh, uh, I've I, I on screen. Um, so it, it does a, a few uh, tricks. Uh, for example, it does path compression. Path compression is when you have, like in this case, pump, PUMP, like without any siblings anywhere. So you don't want to like just have four nodes for each word, each letter. So you can just compress that uh, word into a single um, node and, uh, and you save on like the memory usage for all the other nodes, right? And uh, you also have adaptive length. So instead of having 256 uh, uh, children for each node, regardless of whether you have it or not, you will have adaptive uh, length. Um, again, you cannot have like a random length. You cannot have like things like 
um, three nodes or five arrays of sizes of three or seven or nine because you want to be um, it, you want it to be cache friendly and CPU uh, friendly. So uh, what R does is it splits the nodes into like sizes of fixed sizes of four, sixteen, uh, forty-eight, and two fifty-six. And so it, it kind of fits into the CPU cache and they use uh, some tricks to be able to like apply SAMD instructions uh, to, to do traversals and to, to, to do like lookups and so on. Um, and uh, so uh, again, it's uh, in the interest of time, I will, uh, I'm not going into the details, but uh, implementing this and implementing, uh, we, so um, um, I found a library which, which was open source, which implemented a basic version of art uh, on, and we, we had to implement the whole uh, Levenstein distance uh, typo tolerant traversals on top of that. So that was uh, something that uh, we did. And I, 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 I'm not aware of uh, 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 like a, another open source implementation, at least that has, that, that has implemented Levenstein typo correction on top of a tribe. Okay, one question that uh, the correction algorithm on top of art, uh, yeah. is it open source from your end? Or? Yeah, yeah. Typesense is completely open source. Uh, if you go to github.com slash typesense slash typesense, that's a C++ repo. Uh, the file is art.cpp. You can look at, look into that. Awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, maybe you cannot go into the entire thing uh, right now, but maybe I I do not understand how this can, art can make it uh, cash friendly. Can you explain that a little bit? Right, right. Okay, cool. Let's say, let's, uh, let's come back to that, uh, this, this particular example of uh, this uh, typo correction, right? So um, let's say I am looking for the word, um, let me pick uh, something else. Um, okay, let's go with this word itself, F-A-I-R-E, right? So, the minute I come to FA, right, and I realize, uh, I, so these two in in a in a in a in a, in a classical fry implementation, the, the 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 letters A and I will be part of two different uh, differently allocated uh, nodes. So if you look up, um, if you do as if you have, for example, if you have a struct as each of the node, uh, A and uh, I will A and I will be like uh, they will the indexes into A and I will will be created using a new operator. So they will be in different parts of the RAM. Uh, what R does is they will have a care array where A and I will be right next to each other. So when I when I go look up FAIR, um, uh, the way you do where you will do is you you will always be greedy. The way the implementation Levenstein implementation works is you will always be greedy. Even though if you've, uh, when you find F and A, even though you've found A, you will actually look at I also, because you might, you do not know whether A has a, A is a typo or not. And in this case, it turns out that A is a typo because F, A, and I'm not able to find I. So uh, in the actual implementation of Le the Levenstein distance, what we do is we will look up at A and also look at all the siblings of F because we do not know whether the next letter is a typo. It will lead to a, uh, the correct word or is a typo there or it's a missing letter right, right, there, right? So when you do this uh, uh, lookups, uh, having these characters right next to each other really speed it up. Otherwise you will be doing a pointer in direction uh, into the into into the sibling character, which will hit a different part of the uh, memory. Uh, uh, this is again uh, explained in the paper. Uh, um, uh, so it, it is uh, it is it is not so much of a problem if you're just doing straight up lookups, uh, where if you not find the next character, you just bail out. It might it won't help. But especially for uh, like uh, like fuzzy lookups, it makes a lot of uh, uh, difference. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So, um, so, so with, with all, so we spoke about the network uh, latency part, uh, how we solve for that by not having shard and going uh, to a single node and, 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 uh, you know, having a geo replicated draft cluster to take care of the high availability part. Uh, and then we spoke about uh, the data structures that it takes to, for you to really do uh, quick uh, prefix lookups and quick fuzzy searching. And uh, there are also a lot more other things uh, uh, that we do. I have not spoken about uh, filtering. I have not spoken about uh, sorting. Um, um, and uh, these, again, a lot of uh, hand crafting has gone, uh, micro benchmarking and tweaking the code has gone into all of that so with with, with all this uh, uh, set of things you are able to get to sub 50 millisecond results uh, with millions of records so that's what uh, we aim for um, for a vast set of use cases this is uh, excellent for mobile apps and so on you are able to get like a really good interactive search you 
when you make a search, you don't even realize whether that request is going to your backend and coming back or it is being stored within your mobile phone um, and, and, you're, and, you're, and you're getting it from there. So, um, and I, I actually showed these demos uh, like uh, earlier, uh, maybe I can maybe do this uh, geo search. Um, show you like, this is again, uh, we also support uh, geographic uh, data sets. So let's say this is some Airbnb data, right? Um, again, you can you can look at different uh, points, look at uh, like, you know, things with heating, things with kitchen, or whatever. And then you can do like bits two to 16 and it instantly updates. <clears throat> so this is again a kind of a, a use case that you can build with uh, TypeSense uh, because instant search is not just about just the keyword lookups, it's also applying filtering, sorting, and uh, facetting. This is called facetting. You're breaking down a property type into like the individual values that occurs in the data set and doing counts on them so you can very quickly see which are most popular and then that helps you decide, right? So, um, so this is another demo. Uh, I've shown the other two demos here. And then uh, this one, we built this demo as a, like a, a for the, Linux kernel that crossed 1 million commits uh, earlier, I think last year, uh, last year. So we built this site for that. So you can basically go and search all the commit messages. You can just like, for example, check floppy, what, what people are, are writing about that, um, race condition and, and, and so on, right? And you can see, okay, what is, a, how much, uh, what is Linux? what has written, what is the commits that Linus has written about race conditions and so on. So anyway, so this is the, this is a, this is another demo and uh, this is another thing that will be really fast, uh, sub, sub 50 milliseconds uh, end to end. And, and, and the reason this is um, uh, uh, like fast is also because, uh, 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 because of uh, TypeSense, uh, uh, I can maybe quickly show you uh, our cloud, uh, but it's really, there's really nothing uh, different than what is whatever is available open source. So uh, if you look uh, for the, the demo that uh, is being hosted, it's uh, it, it's in this five regions, Sydney, Sao Paulo, Oregon, Frankfurt, Mumbai. And anytime I, I search here, it, it knows that the client library knows that I am in Chennai and it's closest to Mumbai, it will route me to the nearest uh, uh, server. So that, that uh, logic sits in the client and we have to implement it's it's only javascript that we have to implement for um, and maybe ios um, and uh, that that logic will that, that helps us uh, find the closest um, server for so, server to uh, like server request so uh, our, cl our, our cloud offering like allows you to do uh, like do that very fast but really there is nothing stopping uh, uh, you from doing it on your own infrastructure and on your own uh, set of servers. Um, so that's that. Okay, and let's get to user interface. Uh, this is like the final section of my <clears throat> talk. Um, it, yeah, yes, it, as, I, as I said earlier, like uh, if you are doing just static pages uh, or maybe even a static search where you have to type something and press a submit button and a page renders, that is uh, significantly easy to build. Uh, but with a user interface, you saw how many elements were jumping on the screen, right? As I was typing, your first set counts were changing, your filters were constantly getting updated, and your results were getting re-rendered as and as how how you typed. So it's really difficult to build this. Uh, and um, so thankfully, we uh, so let's look at the elements that are getting on updated on screen. As I'm typing here, you will have to update this facet columns uh, uh, and the counts associated with the release date and you know 1970s all the counts associated with it then you will have to render this uh, like I want to search within artists so you have to render that and support searches within that uh, then you also need to sh do pagination show the results found and then you have to do highlights uh, like I have typed only like in this result uh, wonder wonder wall versus cover only the first two letter words have to be highlighted because that's what the keyword uh, the query has so um, so you have to do all of that. So it's not easy, right? So what we have done is we have integrated with a library called Instant Search JS. It's actually, uh, interestingly, it's from our competitor called Algolia, uh, uh, but it is it's a great library. So we don't uh, uh, we don't have any uh, uh, regrets in integrating with them, and it also helps uh, their customers to like uh, migrate over 
uh, because it's easy for them to like, uh, because we integrate with the same front end library. So, uh, so I want to show you like this e commerce demo that we saw, right? This entire thing, including all this uh, sub filtering of parents and like pagination and all, all that stuff. Um, uh, it's only about 250 lines of code, uh, front end 282 to be precise, because you have like a bunch of widgets that instant search offers, like search box, pagination, refinement list, hits is the list of results that you see. Uh, slider and, and ratings and so on. So you just uh, initialize type sense, you give a list of nodes. Uh, you could, it could be one node or it could be five nodes if you have like a geographically distributed uh, setup. And then uh, then you just add those widgets, right? You say a search box is going to be in this container and you have a bunch of options, what you want to do with it, like placeholder and so on. Similarly for pagination and all the other things, you put all of this together and you get a you get this and you just have to apply some stylings you can get a very nice this is like the rails crud equivalent of search um and uh and exactly the same code uh, is, is about 250 280 lines powers this powers this so you can imagine how uh, fast you can get running let's let's say you want to give a prototype or a demo to your customer like for a new feature you can like really quickly build it using instance of JS, so you don't have to manually deal with all these state transitions. Like, what do I do when the slider goes back and forth? How do I update all these things and maps and all this? You don't have to like uh, go through all of that. So um, that's that. And uh, yeah, if you uh, love to have more contributors, like uh, 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 the core engine is in C plus plus, but um, uh, uh, we have. Uh, libraries in a bunch of uh, uh, languages if you uh, wish to contribute for a languages that uh, it is not there uh, we'd love to like uh, um, you know uh, have your help like so we support these languages i think there's also go but it's not here in the documentation yet uh, but yeah we, we have a nice uh, clean api you don't have to unlike elasticsearch they don't have to go through hundreds of uh, pages thousands of uh, Parameters. It's a good Swiss Army. Uh, you know, it's a good Swiss Army knife. It can do everything you want it to do. You can make it bend however you want it to bend. You can make it flow how you want it to flow. But uh, for the use cases that TypeSense targets, uh, uh, it it is much much easier, much much faster to like you know to just uh, do it. Like you you it, it also supports you, you it also supports schema, so it's strongly typed. If you want, uh, we have also have auto schema detection, and so. Um, you, you can mix uh, with the best of both worlds. If you want some integrity for your uh, data in two types, you can do that, or you can also have like a automatic schema detection and so on. So um, yeah, I think that's it from me. Uh, I will stop now um, uh, and open to uh, any questions. Thank you, sir. How do you warm up this data? How do you warm up it in this? So, so, uh, so the, since everything is uh, in memory, it's like Redis, uh, we have a snapshot of the raw data. So when you index, let's say like a million documents, everything is the, the raw documents are stored as they are uh, in uh, JSON on the, on, on the local, uh, uh, we use RocksDB as a key value store. Um, and uh, and on, when the instance starts up, we re-index it back into memory. And uh, that's another reason why I said we support only like, uh, you know, 100 million, uh, 100 million ish uh, data sets, uh, because uh, you cannot do this, like if you have like a billion or like if you have like 10 terabytes, you cannot, even if you've found a, a, a provider who can give you 10, 10 TB of RAM, you just starting the whole thing up when once it, if it goes down or if you are doing a version update, it's just not possible. Hey, Kishore. Uh, hi. So thanks. Thanks so much for this talk. It was really enlightening. So one question I had is, uh, uh, what about indexing and indexing throughput? Is it uh, built for a certain kind of and frequency of throughput of indexing uh, or and not for frequently updated data? Like what's the, uh, what's it built yeah, for? Yeah. It is built for like extreme high in, 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 uh, indexing speeds because one of the problems we, uh, we constantly encountered is uh, Elasticsearch poor updates, right? They really lag behind, it's really tough. And with all the shots moving all across, uh, like getting a cluster uh, green uh, is very tough. Uh, I managed a 10 terabyte, uh, uh, was it 10 terabyte or 50 terabyte, something like that, a humongous cluster uh, and 
Zapier. Um, and, uh, and it was really painful watching those uh, because because uh, ultimately what uh, Lucene is an immutable uh, uh, library. So uh, the way Elasticsearch have implemented them as like immutable segments, you have different segments on this. So everything is an append. And when you want to do an uh, update, it, it just takes the entire document, updates the field and writes it back. And then in the background, they join it. Uh, which is really slow, and uh, um, and it, that's one of the reasons why the updates are very really slow. But in TypeSense, uh, again, there's a new data structure for that. We call it as unrolled linked list, uh, which we use to like really speed up uh, uh, your uh, updates, uh, which was implemented only in the last uh, version of TypeSense. Uh, until then, it was like, uh, I mean, that's the thing about, uh, that's the cool thing about memory. And memory is fast enough uh, for a lot of people. So we used to have like a giant array. You want to in, in, insert something in between. You just like rewrite the whole thing and put it back on. Right, but of course, we reached a point where that wasn't working for the larger customers, especially people with like tens of millions of records. So we we had to redesign that data structure and uh, rewrite it, um, and that's how we ended up with that un, uh, unrolled linked list. Uh, you can maybe Google that up. Uh, so with that, we are able to get like uh, we, we amortize the cost of uh, updates. Uh, hi, Kishore Ashwari here. So uh, one concern I felt while working with Elasticsearch is like, you know, how do we deal with the nested fields? So like, you know, they, if they have some array, they flatten it and then you have to use like nested queries, which is slow. So are we doing like similar thing here or are we treating like nested documents any different here? Yeah. So uh, the number one upvoted feature request on TypeSense uh, with like, I think 35 upvotes now is uh, nested fields support. Uh, right now, we just ask people to uh, flatten their documents. Um, it might not always be possible. For, for, for us, like the majority of the cases, let's say you have a person object with a first name and last name, you can just do a person dot first name, person dot order, just flatten it and before indexing it. Uh, I agree, it might not always be possible. Let's say you have a this array of objects, it's not possible to very easily do that. So, uh, so the way we will be, and that's going to be the number one feature we're going to work on in the next release, uh, is what we are planning to do is uh, flatten it and store it. Uh, and um, and on the display, we will uh, nest it back and give it. So you will still have that uh, column wise uh, speed because you are not going to uh, mostly uh, query the entire nested object, only specific fields usually. Um, uh, so it'll get flattened. It'll be, the flattening happens will, right now people are doing the flattening manually, but the system will take care of flattening it in future. Uh, thanks. Okay, sure. Who, uh, how does this authentication is handled or is a responsibility of the client to handle the authentication or authorization case? Yes. So uh, the way the, what we do is uh, we, so we generate, we allow you to generate an API key from a parent API key. So what you do is uh, because see, let's say I have, let's say I have 10,000 customers and uh, I, it is very difficult for me to generate one API key for every customer. Uh, if I want to scope them to specific uh, either collections or I want to scope, uh, scope them to a specific filter. For example, let's say there's only one collection and then I have a field called org ID, right? And I want uh, I want to scope uh, a, a particular customer to a particular org ID. What I can do is uh, I will generate a, a key on the client side, not server side, TypeSense doesn't manage it. What happens is you generate a key and you ask, and the key will have the, the filter baked into it. So let's say the filter is org ID equals 100. Okay, so what I do, what we do is we we crypto we cryptographically hash it. We create we get a signature from that HMAC, uh, so that uh, when you, uh, and then what we will do is when we when, when the client makes a request, we take the key, uh, get the HMAC part of it, uh, signature part of it, and then we we and the, and the filter itself is part of the key in a base uh, uh, base encoded form. So we will get the filter, rehash it, compare the HMAC signature with the one on the key, and verify that you know it is uh, not being tampered. So by doing this, you are basically able to generate keys on the client side um, and without having to like generate thousands of uh, keys on the uh, server and managing them. So you can, you can uh, so we, you, you can generate these, uh, what we, we call this as scoped API keys. Uh, and then we are able to ensure that, you know, nobody is able to do a filter. Right? If I want this, let's say somebody is trying to do like org ID 200 when they are not supposed to, they cannot do it because the minute they change the search query to org ID 200, and uh, you send the same key, the cryptographic, uh, the HMAC uh, signature is going to mismatch and we will reject that request. Okay, thanks.
So, Kishore, uh, I mean, so one was about the th throughput, right? I think, has there been uh, a pattern about the kind of use cases that uh, you've been finding a lot of adoption for, especially on the commercial side? Um, uh, what were the kind of industries use cases that you've really seen, given this whole vertical scaling constraint, et cetera? Yeah, see, the thing is, uh, uh, most people are, 95% uh, of the people don't have large data. And, uh, but they, the, they spend an enormous amount of time setting up, like let's say you want to search only 10,000 records, the amount of time that it takes to set up Elasticsearch, understand what it means and all that uh, uh, is like humongous, right? So we are targeting that other 95% of the people, uh, which, is a, which, uh, which is like a huge market because um, even if you take the even if you take the uh, databases, right, Postgres databases and stuff like that, they they like 10 million, 100 million rows is like a real big amount of uh, data already for a lot of people. Uh, the guys who are having billions of rows, they are not looking to do searching on top of them. They are looking to do a durable storage and like lookups and so on. So they are very, it's very only log storage and metrics and monitoring and stuff like that. In, for example, security incidents. That's why you have like a large volume of data and you want to be fast and you want to do querying. And we are not going there. Uh, what we are focusing on uh, is e-commerce. Um, where search literally prints money. So it's, uh, like all the things about speed and stuff comes into play. And none of the things like the Amazons will be able to do like machine learning is possible because you don't have that many customer data and that, uh, you don't carry that many products. You cannot do data mining. You cannot do personalization. Where the only key thing that can really uh, make a difference is the speed of search. And uh, you know, you've seen that uh, statistic, right? Every uh, one person, uh, every 10 milliseconds scroll down is one person driving the old loss or something like that. So, uh, so that really helps. And the other use cases that we see is like uh, just, uh, you know, like searching uh, like uh, blogs or searching uh, like internal um, uh, community like uh, internet, intranet uh, kind of uh, internal apps. Uh, uh, the, those things a wide broad basket. There is not a, 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 a small data is far more prevalent than we think. If you are exposed to lead to the large uh, world, is a huge uh, amount of people who just don't have that much data, but they still want like good search experiences on top of them. Cool. Thanks. Uh, guys, you you have any any more questions to ask to to Kishore? Okay, so a couple more. So <clears throat> one is uh, so in recent times, besides Algolia, right, there have been a bunch of attempts to build something similar like Miley Search, I think, in Rust and and a bunch of others, right? Like, how do they compare? What how much of a threat are they? Uh, where do they stand? Yeah, so uh, broadly speaking, um, from a business, uh, so I'll answer it in two ways. I'll answer it from a business perspective from a from from a technical perspective from a business perspective i think uh, uh, i'm not worried about competition because it's such a large market uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Algolia is a leader in this space. They are proprietary, they're not open source. But if you go and ask developers, every time I talk to developers, they know Elasticsearch and that's what they reach out for first. They don't even, Algolia has probably spent tens of millions of dollars in their brand building, marketing over the last seven, eight years, but people just don't know them, right? So that's how the big the market is and it's growing much faster. So uh, more competitors are welcome uh, and we are not in any way like, uh, you know, in a rush to like, we're playing a really long game here. Uh, we're not in a rush to like you know like uh, exit or anything so that's fine uh the other the other thing about um the other uh, main players here is obviously uh, uh elastic as uh, app search uh, um, uh which is an offering which is hosted which basically simplifies elastic search for you but it's a hosted offering it's not a uh it's not a open source thing and you will still there are still rough edges that elastic search for example doing fuzzy searching with sorting on a field is really tough like you cannot say that you know I want uh, type uh, words uh, records with no typos to be above records with typo one and typo two. Just no, there's no way possible you can do that in Elasticsearch. So they inherit some of those uh, problems. Um, there is Algolia, which is uh, which is which which probably uh, is trying to do that. But the one way that we refer from both Algolia and MilliSearch, MilliSearch is uh, also trying to do it in an open source format. They have a very major restriction where um, if you want uh, if you want to sort by a different field. You have to duplicate your entire index. So imagine I have uh, 10 million records, and this is uh, so they they are very fast because they are pre-sorted. The disk, uh, the data is pre-sorted on the disk. So we have had customers uh, always coming to us and like, hey, you know, we wanted another sort order, but now we build doubles. 
So, and we don't want that. And doesn't, it doesn't build confidence that when you are saying that, you know, I have to do duplicate, they will do it for you. They, it's not like you need to create index and manage it, but the minute you want to sort by another thing, they will have to do it. And that takes a lot of uh, uh, IO, it takes a lot of um, CPU. Um, and, but what TypeSense has done is they are able to, yes, solve this on the fly sorting and on the fly filtering really fast. Right, so so it offers a lot of flexibility for people. It will be a little slower on large data sets because obviously you know, it's n log n. You cannot beat it or n log k in uh, search world because you are not trying to sort all the records but only the top few hundred or whatever you need. Um, uh, but it's fast enough for uh, for uh, like a vast majority of uh, use cases. Uh, and we might add pre sorted uh, indices in future if that is a that is a threat. Uh, but that's a one major feature that um, uh, many search they have kind of inherited the flaws uh, flaw that uh, Elasticsearch, uh, I mean, um, Algolia has, which we have solved. And there are a few other things like uh, we support infix searching in the next release, which uh, which is uh, which is not supported by either of these two engines. And uh, and we have a lot more things planned. I think uh, so. Uh, it's just getting started phase. We are in just that phase because. Uh, like it's not an MVP that you can build on a weekend or on a, in a month. Uh, it has taken five, six years to build this out. So we have now a nice base to operate from. And so the differentiations will uh, occur pretty fast. Awesome. No, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's seriously impressive what, what you've been able to do. How big is your team now? Uh, how, how many people besides two of you? And uh, we are very small. We are uh, four people uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, we might uh, some some interns come and go. We sometimes we hire people on a part-time basis, but yeah, it's a very small team. So that this includes everybody who's taking care of the cloud infrastructure and yes, and, uh, clients on call yes. and everything. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. So it, it's just uh, built over a very ridiculously long period of time, right? Uh, and uh, you should check out uh, TypeSense blog. I, I wrote about it. Um, uh, the amount of stuff that you can do just by spending an hour or two a day, like you can literally build it out. It, the first three years were just like building the core CPP engine, uh, no client libraries, nothing. And then next three years were like uh, client libraries and the last one year is TypeSense Cloud. So if you look at it that way, the magic is gone. But uh, but yeah, but it's interesting. We uh, we are uh, we you can launch. Uh, we support like nearly eighteen or twenty regions. Uh, uh, you can launch a cluster that spans across four continents, three continents. Uh, we keep everything synced, and uh, yeah, we 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 are able to manage with a small team. Awesome. Since nobody's asking, I'm, I'm going to keep going for a couple more if you're okay with Sure. It. Yeah. Uh, okay. Free. What's, what's been the experience with uh, C++? Um, so, yeah, see, yeah, yeah. See, the um, it's it's at most both wonderful and dreadful. If I have to summarize uh, my my thing, I'm not uh, I'm not a language freak in the sense uh, I, I I don't necessarily think that you know like a uh, uh, lang uh, and I have matured on this over the years. Uh, languages do not really make or break. Companies, for example, Rust versus CPP. If you asked me, like, if I went back in time, would I pick CPP? Hundred percent, yes, I'll pick CPP because uh, some of the things that, for example, Millisearch doesn't have a clustering solution. They don't. They are just a single instance, so uh, they don't even have an HA, right? Nobody serious in business would uh, would 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 be like you know will have second thoughts of picking such a solution. Uh, and the reason is very simple: there is no mature Rust clustering library out there. Uh, there is HashiCorp has a very good library in Go, uh, uh, which is Raft. Uh, they use it for their products. And then Baidu has a really good one in C, C++, which we use for TypeSense. But there's just no, nothing stable in Raft. I'm sure the ecosystem will catch up over time. But, uh, and, uh, and uh, like, you know, with Facebook and Google, a uh, lot of interesting data structures, all of them land, most research data, research, research papers, their implementations land in CPP or C first. Right, and anyway, most libraries need a C binding because you want to expose it to Python, you want to expose it to Ruby, none of them are going away. So C library and no JS. So C is a very common uh, lingua franca there and that's not going to get replaced. So uh, I completely uh, uh, feel vindicated by choosing C++ and anyway, seven years back, uh, we'd be crazy to choose uh, another language. There's not much there. Uh, Go was ruled out because we were doing just, uh, the GC process will just not work for our uh, interactive searches. Uh, scenario. So, but uh, from a from a from a hiring and point of view, yes. If you restrict yourself, it's like Scala, 
uh, which uh, in my previous uh, in ThoughtWorks uh, used a lot of Scala. It's, the language has a large footprint and there's a lot of areas where you can shoot yourself in the foot, um, uh, leaks, memory leaks and stuff you don't, if you are not careful. Uh, but uh, yeah, but given overall the trade-offs of the rich ecosystem and the ability to hire, I think uh, I think it's uh, it's not a it's not a big deal. But did, did you did you uh, actually know that you program C plus plus before you were actually starting from scratch when you started? Working? Uh I had maybe one year of experience in C plus uh, before. Uh, like some of the stuff we did at Index, uh, so we wrote some analytical engines on CPP, but. Uh, but basically, I learned CPP through my uh, uh, okay. through 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 Typesense. So yeah, I was always. In fact, the first time when we open source the code, code I was very nervous uh, because uh, I was like, I'm not a C plus plus veteran by any means, and uh, and uh, now when you're posting to Hacker News or Reddit, uh, like uh, I was very scared. Like, oh, this is you be you be undefined behavior and it, because the language is uh, you can very easily have undefined behavior all over the place. It will still work, but it'll uh, break one fine day. But yeah. Uh, it doesn't know us. Cool. Yeah, that's that's all I had. Um, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Kishan. Excellent talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, if any of you are looking uh, to use TypeSense, or, I mean, any search engine, uh, Elasticsearch, or like, you know, if you're thinking of moving, or if you're having some issues with Elasticsearch, uh, uh, feel free to email me. I'll be happy to chat. Not to make you move to TypeSense, but to I know even offer. I have done a fair bit of wrangling with Elasticsearch, so I know the nuts and bolts. So feel free to reach out to me. Happy to help. Sure, sure. This is fantastic, uh, Kishore. I think uh, just having seeing somebody do this out of India is, is fairly rare. I think there have been a few examples. I think uh, Narayan built uh, Sahi early in the early. He was one of the early guys, Narayan Raman, and then. I think you and there's a bunch of others, but there's very few. I think it's a real inspiration. I mean, uh, kudos. I hope you guys are really make. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for coming and sharing these insights. I think it's very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Amit, over to you. Any? Yeah, nothing. I mean, it was very <laughs> interesting session to watch and really, really inspiring. Thanks for this, Kishore. Thank you. Thank you. Nice chatting. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.